what role does technology play in financial services currently and what should it be playing realistically? I mean, the role of technology, especially international um, information technology uh, in financial services has been tremendous and it has been for decades. Now. I think we all understand that the efficiency that we've been seeing in financial services from transaction processing to self-serving and our ability to self-serve relies completely on technology capability. Um, customer experiences, insights on customers that allow us to tailor products and things like that. So technology, accessibility, another one. Uh, remote areas have been served for mobile uh, sort of networks in, in UPI and all the rails in India. Accessibility, financial inclusion, a lot of that has been done through technology. Innovation altogether, you know, talk wallets, uh, talk crypto, talk all these things. So I think the role of technology as an enabler, and I think that links very much with what Andrew was talking about as an enabler will continue. Um, we will rely on it to continue to increase efficiency, increase good experiences and all of this. Now, and I'm gonna talk about a bit of a, about AI because that's my thing. Uh, nice day. If we think about for Gen AI, um, especially Gen AI, of course uh, AI, I, I will say, has existed for a long time, despite all the novelty that seems to be around, around that. Um, it's becoming the most uh, impactful on how humans and machines interact. It's completely disrupting how we interact with technology as human beings. And that um, is probably one of the most disruptive innovations. If you think about the internet and what it did to financial services, smartphones and what it did to financial services, Gen AI is probably the next one. So answer your question, what technology is doing today is enabling. I do still believe that what technology needs to continue doing for us is enabling, and there has to be a role, again, for the human in how to use it and to use it safely and to make sure that it is serving, our, serving us rather than the other way around. Um, but that's what I see for technology. It's going yeah. to continue to be a big enabler of financial services and, and of innovation in financial services. I completely agree. The, the thought of FinTech is being created to ultimately bring financial products that were typically for a very few to the many you see picks being uh, you know taken up by almost half of brazil within a couple of months is fascinating to see and you know what you've seen with the recent chat gpt the fact that it can now help blind people move about and understand what is being shown on the screen just shows what can really happen on the accessibility front but one thing that's been really imper you know, important on this element is bringing in wealth management to the people that previously weren't very good at, at you know, looking after their finances and the people that maybe hadn't had the opportunity to have a wealth manager before. So you know, this is where, Callan, I've got to come to you because uh, yeah, we've got to find out a bit more about the fact that you've been utilizing AI since you said, 2017. What's that journey been like? Yeah, and I think I can break it down into we use it. So it's an AI, Cleo, as I mentioned, is an AI financial assistant. And so we refer to her as a she, she talks to you like a friend and using AI and leveraging some open AI models and some of our proprietary models and a few other open source models, we've built an AI that is meant to look at all of your transaction information. So we connect to your bank account using Plaid and then that powers our transaction understanding. So if she's doing her job, she's looking at the inflows and outflows and she's creating dynamic situations for you. So the budget that I get is not gonna be the budget that Andrew gets. It's gonna really talk to him and say, hey, you're spending more than you earn. Hey, you're about to incur a bank fee. Hey, you are kind of like cut back on Starbucks. We'll do this dynamically for you. We'll make this very engaging. And it should really live and breathe with your actual behavior. So it's not static in the sense of that it, it is what it is day one when you set it up. It should evolve as your financial experience evolves with the company. So if you're paying your subscriptions on time, if you are paying your rent on time, we will kind of ingest all this information and then that changes kind of the advice and information that we're giving you. But then on the back end of that, that also changes our strategy. So we're a subscription business and we're a lending business. So we use all of this information to also make sure that our lending strategy is dynamic. So we do two things. The amount of money you're eligible for, eligible for changes over time. So exactly like I said, if we can see that you're paying your subscription on time, you're engaging with budget, you're engaging with savings and habits, we will change your eligibility amount and you will increase your kind of lending capacity over time. But we're also a subscription business and we often serve, I would say, more of a subprime demographic and a younger demographic who's often unaware of their financial mistakes and the things that they might be incurring. So we do not take a subscription and we do not take a lending repayment if you don't have the money in your account. 
So we know when your money is getting paid, when your rent is being paid, and when you're likely to be able to afford that subscription or that loan. And so not only are we kind of like training you and helping you do this through all of these models, we're also protecting you because we're not going to, our kind of motto is that we're not going to make money by you doing poorly with your money. So there's no late fees, there's no predatory elements or fees associated with this. It's a subscription-based service. So, and that also helps our business because failed transactions cost money. Arrears are not good for the business. So we can both use these models to both help bolster our lending capacity, but also make sure that these users are actually being helped. It's kind of a win-win scenario. Um, and so in the last two years, we've seen massive improvements in our ability to both engage the chat and have it really be predictive, dynamic, and, and speaking to you about you, as well as massively improved our subscription and lending business. Um, I think we grew 150% uh, of our revenue last year as a result of a lot of this. So. Incredible. I mean, it really does speak to this, you know, if, you, if we all think of finance as being, you know, the business of reducing risk and improving trust, the fact that you've managed to improve the trust with your customers and then also reduce their risk and then on the same time done the same to your own books is absolutely fascinating. And, and do you think that's going to enhance in the future? You know, can we talk more about that balance between risk and trust? And you know, do you think that all your customers just automatically trust Clio? Is she you know, immediately that kind of just people feel very comfortable talking to her? Yeah, and I, I think we've seen that. I think our engagement in terms of what you typically see someone engaging with their bank or a traditional financial technology application, I think we're about 4x to 5x the amount of time spent actually using the application. Yeah. So we're definitely seeing kind of growing user behavior change and trusting her more. Um, I also think as you stick around and retention improves on the app and your lending capacity does grow, I think the trust that she is here to help you and grow with you is we're really earning that reputation and that's what we're hearing from our users. Um, and we're also trying to figure out, all right, we're, we can't roll out products and services to meet all of our needs of our users constantly. So if we're an AI assistant that's supposed to help you save on taxes, save on your mortgage, do debt consolidation, but we can't spin these products up fast enough or in a safe enough manner. So we're also figuring out, okay, well, how do we use this technology to work with trusted partners to say, okay, it might not be Clio that you need money in lending from. We actually can recommend a loan that's probably a much do a higher dollar amount than our books can afford, but we think this is the right thing to do. And so kind of building that trust that we're not, we're not trying to hawk our own products at you necessarily. We're trying to serve products and services that actually meet their legitimate needs and therefore build more trust. Amazing. Now, you know, we are in such a heavily regulated industry, but we're not the only ones. And uh, Andrew, you, you mentioned when we were in the green room talking a bit more about other industries and, and the kind of uh, intersectionality between the technologies. And I believe you were bringing up a, a concept within the medical industry, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I thought about this and I brought along a book with me. Here's a book called Deep Medicine by Eric Topol. He's an American physician. And he has gone through all the things that we have wrong with us, you know, can have wrong with us as human beings, and asked the question, is the machine better at doing this or the human being? And in a number of cases, the evidence seems to be absolutely clear. The machine is much better than the human being. Look at a skin issue. In general, folks, if you've got a skin issue, the machine is better than the doctor, okay? Says the evidence here. For a number of things, particularly which are complex, which are comorbid, you've got various things wrong with you, which are linked to psychological issues, you know, frankly, a doctor is better. And going back to my theme of the combination of the two, his thesis, which I, you know, think is pretty powerful, is, well, actually, allowing machines to do a lot of things that scarce human beings can't do is a very good idea, because that then allows the doctors to spend more time with the patients discussing the things that really matter to the patients. So again, in terms of saying, is it AI or the, or the doctors, the answer is no. It's both of them, you know, and one enabling the other. And I think that's a, you know, that's a pretty good model in terms of saying, so what can happen? Yeah, amazing. I almost picked the robotic hand out stretched <laughs> to the, the poor skinned hand as the, the human. But, um, you know, we've, we've heard these, this positive elements, it's improved trust, it's improved, you know, bank balances of clear as customers. But I think there's, we can't just be talking in, you know, you know, rosy images, right? Uh, uh, Alicia, I've got to get your perspective on, you know, there's got to be some huge, fearful elements here. I'm not setting up with a, a kind of uh, closed question there, am I? Sorry, but, you know, I'd love to get the kind of maybe balanced discussion here, and there's, there's more to discuss, right? 
I mean, I normally like to talk about the positives and the use cases and all that's possible uh, with, uh, with artificial intelligence and any technological innovation, but it's, it's not, um, it wouldn't be realistic to think that there's no risk associated to it. And we've had them with all sorts of technology innovation we've had so far, so cybersecurity, data privacy, um, job loss. I mean, even, even with the technology revolutions of the past, like the industri industrial revolution, we had uh, people breaking the machines because that was, that was, uh, that was a, a risk at that point. And we, we're going to go and continue to have those kinds of effects. Um, one thing that I would say is all of that will continue. Uh, what is happening with these new technologies, and I'm, I'm again talking about artificial intelligence and Gen AI and all of these things, and, and the more digital um, even, uh, the, the technology is also at the hands of the threat actors. So, I mean, I, one, one of the things that we talk a lot about in Visa um, is precisely so, that is protecting, is how do you protect uh, transactions? How do you protect the, the end customer? Because what we're seeing is that those threat actors are going up the chain. Um, and as you put protections into in the transaction um, for the, to, to control fraud or to control authorization, et cetera, they're now moving into a more, um, when we talk the front of it is digital identity theft, digital twins, uh, fake synthetic personal, um, synthetic identities to sort of come from the top of the funnel into the transaction, the financial services sort of. Um, so again, all of these advances, all this innovation also f uh, sort of uh, fuels increased risk. And that's something that we need to, to manage. Um, again, the type of risk as well changes. So with Gen AI, for example, we have things, a lot of more misinformation, fakes, we have bias to the end um, because it allows it to, to do that. Uh, with agents operating on our, on our name, things that uh, potentially Andrew is talking about when he talks about the human and the role of the human is, what is the role of the human and what is the impact in society? That's not something that necessarily we've been forced to, to ask ourselves, and that's a risk. It's a risk about our own identity and how individuals are going to see themselves. And there's an, a, a huge um, impact as well of responsibility and accountability. So who is responsible for things that are done by agents on our name? So uh, it, not to talk about the privacy impact. So there's a new type of risk coming up in a, a, maxi a maximization of some risks that were there already. And, not to say, and now with that gloomy sort of prospect, I still think, yeah. and I'm still a very a strong innovation and AI enthusiast, but all, all of these are things that we as a society and regulators, et cetera, need to work out if we're to actually reap the benefits of this.